Good afternoon, everyone. And here's my sermon from this morning's service services on the 4th of July. And our readings are taken from Job chapter 6, 1 to 4, verses 14 to 17, and chapter 7, verses 7 to 10. Then Job answered, Oh, that my vexation were weighed, and all my calamity laid in the balances. For then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words have been rash. For the arrows of the Almighty are in me. My spirit drinks their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. Those who withhold kindness from a friend forsake the fear of the Almighty. My companions are treacherous like a torrent bed, like freshets that pass away, that run dark with ice, turbid with melting snow. In time of heat they disappear. When it is hot they vanish from their place. Remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. The eye that beholds me will see me no more. While your eyes are upon me, I shall be gone. As the cloud fades and vanishes, so those who go down to Sheol do not come up. They return no more to their houses, nor do their places know them any more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel reading is taken from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So may I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Last week, in our unfolding of Job's story, we heard what the first of his friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, had to say. What comfort he had to bring or not. And in essence, his approach was this. Job, suffering is part of human life and it's punishment for wrongdoing. So judging by the amount you're suffering, you must have been guilty of some pretty heinous crimes. But don't worry, Job. If you're a man of integrity, you'll get through this period in your life. And if you are repentant and appeal to God, he'll restore all that you've lost. This week, we hear some of what Job says in response. But to read all of it, you'll need to look at chapters 6, 7, 16, 17 and 23. But what does his response to Eliphaz teach us? Remember, Job has said that it would have been better if he'd never been born. He's asked the question, why? Why am I suffering? And last week, we heard how Eliphaz tried to respond to that. This week, it's Job's turn. And the first thing we see from his response is that when we suffer, we don't think logically. In fact, we don't really think at all. Instead, we are driven mainly by emotions, driven by the heart and not the head. And often our first response is to shoot the messenger. Although in Job's case, maybe his friends really deserved it. Now in Job's case, these messengers weren't bringing the truth, just their perception of it. But Job does listen. And this is something we should do too, if in the midst of our suffering, someone tries to help us. Because as I said, when we looked at Job's initial response, When we are suffering, our perception of reality becomes distorted, inwardly focused. We only focus on the suffering and nothing that has gone before and nothing that may come in the future. So lesson number one is to listen, really listen to what our comforters have to say. 
and try to discern with God's help if what is being said is the truth. Take responsibility for the things that are yours. Lay down the untruths, the things that don't matter. Just give them to God. Secondly, try to be in tune with how you're feeling. Because as we saw from the excerpt this morning, Job is still full of self-pity. Oh, that my vexation were weighed and all my calamity laid in the balances. For then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. For the arrows of the Almighty are in me. My spirit drinks their poison. And who can blame him? He's lost his children, his animals, his wealth, his status, possibly his wife and most of his friends. And frankly, the ones he's left with, he'd be better off without. So I think he's allowed to feel a bit sorry for himself. But he doesn't stay with that emotion. He doesn't stay in that place. In this section of the book of Job, we see him moving on. In chapter three, his lament was a very dark place to be. Job wished he'd never been born. Job wished he could die. But in chapter six and seven, Job's focus is less on embracing death and more about fighting, fighting to prove his innocence, to clear his name. He begins to look beyond his suffering and starts trying to understand what has happened, why it's happened and what it all means. He recognises that he needs to do more. Thirdly, his focus turns from himself and his friend and moves instead towards God. He complains about how he is being treated, about why God is focusing specifically on him. And he asks again, why? Why have you made me your target? Why have I become a burden to you? Why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? You might think, as Job's friends do, that this is no way to speak to God. And perhaps it doesn't show a great deal of reverence and awe. But what I think we need to take from this is less about what Job says and more about the fact that he is still, even in the midst of his suffering, communicating with God. As the Satan argued in the heavenly court, it's easy to love God when life goes well. But true faith, is about trusting God, remaining faithful, even in the face of this unimaginable suffering. Now Job talks to God, but let's not forget that we don't see or hear any of Job's friends doing the same. We don't see them talking to God. We don't see them praying to God. We don't see them asking God for wisdom before they start dispensing their idea of it. We don't see them asking for guidance. But Job, Job continues to talk to God. And even when he is unable to find him, as we see in his response to Eliphaz's third lecture in chapters 23 and 24, although he is unable to find him, yet he can still see signs of God at work. The problem is he can't find him to plead his case even though that's what he wants to do more than anything. Because Job trusts completely that if he could only plead his case, he will be vindicated. But what else do we learn? Well, one thing we learn is that there is a lot of emotion involved. And the one we see above all other is frustration. Job's frustration at how useless his friends are at offering comfort. Job's frustration that they seem to have forgotten he's a righteous man. Job's frustration that all they seem able to do is to rub salt into his wounds, to knock him down further instead of building him up. When I was serving my curacy, my training incumbent used to say that the world had two types of people, radiators and drains, and that wherever possible, you wanted to have as little to do with the drains as you could because they would literally drain your enthusiasm, suck your life out of you. Instead, you need to surround yourself with radiators, people who give you life, people who are positive. 
but Job, poor Job, is surrounded by drains. First his wife, then his friends. And if you have encountered drains, you'll know how damaging they can be. Which leads us to a potentially uncomfortable question to ask. Are we drains or radiators? If someone is suffering, maybe a relationship has broken down, or there are health or financial worries, do we offer support and encouragement, or do we knock them down still further? If there's been a disagreement in our family or community, do we allow it to be laid to rest, or do we pick over the bones of it at every opportunity, not allowing people to forgive, forget, lay it before God and move on? Remember how Eliphaz began his first conversation with Job by reminding him of the good he had done. And then recall how, having convinced himself that God will always punish wrongdoing, Eliphaz finishes his final conversation with Job by accusing him of heinous crimes. Eliphaz was definitely a drain and not a radiator. Just at the very moment when Job needed radiators around him, Yet the more Job is exposed to the drains, the stronger his desire becomes to prove his innocence. I don't think we could say this was a deliberate aim of Eliphaz and his friends all along, but nevertheless, it's the effect it has. So in chapter 16, verse 17, Job declares, there is no violence in my hands and my prayer is pure. But what Job realizes is that there is no one on earth to plead his case before God. After all, his closest friends have already decided he's guilty of something, even if they're not too sure what it is. So Job turns away from his earthly companions and turns as we should to a heavenly advocate. Although Job isn't able to identify who that might be. How much easier it is for us because faced with that need, we know certainly and absolutely who our advocate is. Those at St Andrews heard it in the BCP service this morning, in the comfortable words that precede communion. But if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is a propitiation for our sins. Remember the last time God appeared was chapter two in the heavenly court. And with the possible exception of the vision sent to Aliphaz, there is no sign of God intervening or being present until chapter 38. Why is that? Well, quite simply, it's because God doesn't need to be there. Because God is sure of Job's integrity. God is sure that Job will not turn away from his faith however bad it gets, whatever advice he receives from his friends. Because what God knows is that Job treasures up the word of God, that he follows God's commandments faithfully, because he is a blameless and upright man. And if Job knows nothing else about the situation he finds himself in, he too knows this. In chapter 23, verse 11, he says, My foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and have not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandments of his lips. I have treasured in my bosom the words of his mouth. Job trusts that God is sovereign over all. Job knows that God is in control. And Job knows that God knows what will happen. And even if Job can't find God at this precise moment, however hard he looks, he knows that God has got this. When our lives go pear-shaped, do we, will we be as faithful as Job? And the simple answer is that that will depend on whether we, like Job, have treasured the word of God. If we have held fast to our faith, it will depend on whether we have others who can support us, believe in us, be prepared to plead our case and fight our corner. Or whether, like Job, we find ourselves surrounded by miserable comforters, by a load of old drains. I thought a little bit about this 
as I was finishing my sermon and watching the football last night. In the post-match commentary, Alan Shearer and the rest of the pundits were praising Gareth Southgate for holding firm to the way he believed England should play, what formation they should use, who should start, who should be substituted. They asked whether those who had been so disparaging about Harry Kane's performance and ability in the group stages would be saying something different after his performance in the match. And what I thought to myself as I was thinking about my sermon was this. Yes, Alan Shearer, that's all very well. But would you still have been praising Gareth Southgate's tactics if England had lost? Or would you, like Job's friends, have convicted him based on your assumptions? What shines through as we read the three responses to Eliphaz are how much Job's confidence in God increases as he understands the power and majesty of the God he serves. Can we say hand on heart that we do the same? So to summarise, what can we learn from Job's response? Firstly, that emotions rule when we are suffering. Secondly, that we need to recognise that and try not to get stuck in one emotion, whether it's self-pity, frustration, anger or denial. Thirdly, when comforters speak, listen and try to discern the truths in what they're saying, laying down the things that simply don't apply. Fourthly, keep talking to God. Don't stop. Whether you can find him or feel him or not. And even if to start with, all you could manage is a rant. Fifth. Look for the radiators in your life, not the drains. And if, like Job, you only have drains, then maybe you need to cut yourself off from them until you are in a better place. Because above all, in the midst of your suffering, you need building up, not knocking down. Sixth, never forget that however bleak the outlook may be, we, unlike Job, have a permanent advocate interceding constantly on our behalf. Jesus has our back. Seventh, we may think we have lost sight of God. We may not be able to feel his presence, but know this, God never loses sight of us, however far we wander. And finally, when we are in the role of comforter, let us ensure that we are radiators, not drains, and always seek God's guidance in what we say and do. Amen.